All right. Good Friday afternoon. We have got a great session today with some um, really tremendous Hope Lawyer partners. Really looking forward to a great hour. And as we let people join us, let's start with Suzanne. Suzanne, what's your biggest takeaway been um, from the past year and how you've applied that personally and professionally? Um, I think my, well, I can, we, I think we all agree that 220 was probably the most disruptive year in your law, in your entire law practice. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think my biggest takeaway is overcoming, you know, technology on my behalf and, and in others to sort of streamline communications and fighting this limited physical access and, trying to keep, I guess, like the channels close with your clients, even though like, for example, Zoom kind of bumps you back, you know, gives you even further distance. Um, so I think maintaining close relationships in a virtual world is probably my biggest challenge and takeaway. Thank you, Suzanne. Kendra, how about you? I think my biggest takeaway over the last year has been flexibility. I've always needed flexibility in the courtroom but never did I realize the need for it personally and professionally. And what I mean by flexibility is, for example, I've needed to manage and maneuver my client relationships to prepare them for flexibility. So if technology goes out, a Zoom starts 15 minutes later than expected because there is a connection issue, they trust me and understand that that flexibility is all part of us working together. So uh, learning the patience and the flexibility has definitely been an asset. Thank you, Kendra. Janice, how about you? Uh, I, I agree with my colleagues. I think it's been a very uh, stressful year where we all had to learn how to be more flexible and yeah. how to work together. Even yeah. with your, your adversaries, for example, if you get on a court appearance and somebody's down or somebody doesn't know about it, you have to Everybody has to work together to make sure that the system continues to work as best you can. it can. And also with respect to my clients to figure out a way how to meet them and connect with them because uh, I do family law like Kendra does. Uh, and it's, very, it's a very stressful time. So you have to be able to connect with them and help them through this very difficult period to get to the next, uh, to get to the next step. Thank you, Janice. And last but not least, Karen. Yeah, I think the biggest takeaway is that there's been beauty in the simplicity that COVID has forced upon us. And it's perhaps the most human and agreeable year that I've ever had working with against the IRS. Like the conversations is just, they're just more respectful. It, problem, you know, there's been very few conflicts with opposing counsel. Everybody knows that we're, you know, everyone's struggling at this point. Almost everybody knows that someone that's passed away from COVID or that's been hit hard financially or, you know, with their health. So it's just made us put us on an equal playing field. And, and in that way, it's the practice of law is, is I think, in some ways has improved. I, I, sorry, I, I just wanted to jump in that reminded me Janice and Karen both said something interesting, like the humanality of it because it's true when you're on the phone with adversaries and I'm sure even Kendra has this where they can't log in and your help you're like silly their IT department and this is your adversary you know you're just you sound like it kind of it's weird it just puts you in a different perspective and it maybe breaks everybody down to kind of get back up again and sometimes we're doing that together so it's that definitely rang rang familiar with me Great, um, great feedback all the, way, all the way across this panel. Well, we are sure excited here at Hope Living and Hope Lawyer to have each of you with us today. What a great group. So let's start in introducing each one of you. Suzanne DeWitt is the founder and managing partner of DeWitt PLLC with over 21 years of experience in international tax and private wealth planning. She is an expert in the areas of global tax minimization and cross-border wealth planning and implementation. Her work includes the structuring, formation, and operation on a cross-border basis of a variety of alternative investment products. 
Additionally, Ms. DeWitt represents a number of significant Fortune 500 companies and in their international outbound tax planning and global tax minimization projects. Suzanne, thanks so much for being with us. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Looking forward to a great session. Janice, over to you next. Janice Rovin has been practicing law for over 35 years. She became involved in the area of family law because of her own very unfortunate custody battle. As a result, she understands being on both sides of the table. She provides strength, compassion, and the wisdom of personal experience. Janice, thank you. Thanks for having me. And next, over to Karen. Karen Lepecas is on a personal mission to give people peace of mind from the IRS. She previously worked as a senior attorney with the IRS Office of Chief Counsel, where she was the lead attorney for the IRS in more than 170 cases before the U.S. Tax Court. Now at Lepecas Law PA, she represents individuals and businesses against the IRS in audits and collections defense and in litigation in the U.S. Tax Court and the U.S. District Court. In 2020, she also founded My Tax IRS Inc., a service that helps subscribers to never miss or misunderstand an IRS communication ever again. Thank you so much, Karen. Thanks for having me, April. Great to have you here, always. So again, what a great panel. Looking forward to a great hour-long discussion. So let's start over. Let's start with Suzanne. Sure. Suzanne, what has your experience been as a woman and what's, you know, was traditionally a male dominated field? Um, like, you know, COVID aside, um, my, you know, just to focus on the positive on this one. I mean, I'm sure we've all had our male dominated world, you know, problems, but I have to say in transactional areas, it has been interesting because a lot of times where we all have a technical discussion then we'll have a business discussion and then it will go to me and say like intuitively what is your take on this like what does your gut tell you and that's interesting like why am i being asked when my male counterparts are not and um maybe it's that i've heard feedback from clients that say well you just seem to be able to think, you know, ahead and understand like, almost like a personal feeling perspective and have empathy and, you know, look that this is not going to work because they like to do this, this and this. So it's like that personal element. So we have the here and now, but to say, what would you think? And does this really practical as a solution? It's been interesting that as a woman, uh, they've, they've been very transparent and said that because, you know, we value your intuition as well. I want to hear from Kendra next, and so we properly introduce Kendra, mediator, author, attorney, and Thomas Law Office's APC founder. Kendra Thomas is a family law practitioner in Southern California. Kendra represents clients in a variety of family law and dependency court matters, ranging from straightforward mediation to complex trials. She has dedicated her career to helping her clients reach their financial and legal goals while transitioning through the most difficult times in their life. She provides outside strategic counsel to other top name divorce attorneys and in managing the legal teams put together by her firm's concierge programs. So Kendra, quite the resume there. What is, what is your response to that question? Thank you, April. Well, my experience um, prior to COVID was very courtroom driven, and I would see great gender disparity in the courtrooms. I would have male counterparts who would assert a physical presence over me or at times um, interact with me differently or use different strategies because I was a gender uh, because of the gender issues and because I was a woman. However, what I found is um, during COVID times. I think my gender was actually helpful in a number of cases. Once you get um, kind of past the whole, the differences that we shared on a very human level, I think COVID was very humanistic 
and it kind of equalized things for all of us. So I would have um, very contentious cases, very contentious litigation cases with uh, male attorneys where it would actually lead to some vulnerability because of my gender. It would lead to us finding common ground and talking about life before we would talk about the case because they felt that the way that I interacted with my clients or the way that I carried myself or even by virtue of the fact that maybe um, I could be viewed as maybe a little bit softer, allowed them to be a little softer with me during times when they were maybe feeling more vulnerable, but in a courtroom wouldn't express that, but through COVID, you know, felt an outlet for that. So um, I think that it's been a really an interesting time, but the dynamic of it all is it's a really interesting time to be looking at gender issues in law. At least that's what I'm finding. Thank you, Kendra. Janice. Um, I, I, I agree there's kind of a pre-COVID and post-COVID uh, feeling about what's going on. I can tell you that in the law firms that I practiced at, virtually every single time I was sexually harassed, that's, that's number one. So we've all experienced that, I'm sure, right? Everybody on the panel is nodding their head. Uh, that's number one. But also in the courtroom, you also experience it. And uh, on a different level, I mean, there's a woman judge uh, who hates women. It's very bizarre. You, you watch her distinguish, I mean, she treats the guys, the men lawyers and the men much differently than the women. I sat there all day one time just to watch it to make sure I was really seeing what I was seeing. Um, but I think over time, I think post COVID people are a little kinder and you get on the phone and you say, hey, what's, go what's going on? Like, are you okay? And people are actually asking and they wanna hear the answer. It's not like, hi, how are you? I'm fine. It's hi, are you really okay? Um, and people have been uh, very kind, I think, men and women, if people haven't been okay. Uh, so I think COVID has shifted a lot. I wonder if it's going to stay this shift or if everyone, once everybody gets, uh, you know, once people get better and we don't hear COVID anymore, if people are going to be uh, mean, mean again. Mm -hmm. But um, I think there has been a tremendous shift. Um, and, I, and I think like Kendra does, it has been a little equalizing. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Janice. And Karen. April, I've actually forgotten your question already. I was so engrossed in the other ladies. <laughs> like I loved them. Like for example, Suzanne's um, response that actually that the men turn to her and ask her what her intuition is and what her feelings about something are. I, I love that because I think that as women, that's actually our superpower. Yeah, and that's something they can teach you in law school. And I, I say it myself, one of my the greatest things that I can do as a, as a person as a lawyer is to see the problem holistically, mm -hmm. not just see the nail and I'm the tax lawyer hammer, but to see like, look, we can we can work on this, but your real problem is over here. And actually fighting this may cause you more problems financially or whatever than just, you know, maybe you just need to throw money at it and and, and move on. So I love that your male colleague, Suzanne, actually see that in you and value it. Uh, thank you. So, Do you yeah. feel like it's almost like a sixth, a sixth sense in a way? I, I do, definitely. Um, you know, because you, there's a lot of times where it's so easy to give an academic answer to somebody or something that works in, you know, in theory and I'm like, you know, wait a minute, no. Um, so see in the tax area, um, let's even talk about estate planning. I will have gotten the background on their family and their kids, and I will start chiming in with the personal aspects and be like, you know what, that's not gonna work because this and this and this. And the, you know, the wife is located here and I know that she wants to do this. And, you know, so there is definitely you know, I find a lot of times that in preparation for things, um, women, like, I guess, you know, to use Karen's word, superpower, is that we prepare, obviously, the technical stuff, but very in depth from a personal to get like the whole context. And I find that's not done very often, um, you know, by, by men with all due respect. <laughs> there are sometimes we know when someone just needs to be listened to, like, even yeah. when I'm on the phone with it. A contentious revenue agent with the IRS, sometimes I just need to shut my mouth and let them talk. They want to, you know, be in control and be heard. And that can be the best thing instead of me trying to, to, you know, 
make my point clear. Just shutting my mouth sometimes is the best thing I can ever say. Oh, Karen, that is so true in family law. Janice, I don't know if you found that, but sometimes the difference between speaking, hearing, and listening can be the difference between learning something prior to a mediation or in the courtroom versus finding it out at a really inopportune time in the case. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's something that you learn as you get, I don't want to say older, but as you put more time in is when to fold them and when to fold them, you know, when to be able, when to stop talking and let it happen and then know when to kind of enter the process again. Cause sometimes people just need to talk. And once they get it out, we can move on. You know, they just have to say their stuff. And, and, and even if you're, it's your colleague or your adversary, sometimes, or even the judge, you know, the judge sometimes has to just whatever, uh, then once it's, you know, then you can move on and maybe solve the problem or settle the case or. I think, um, yeah, like to Janice's point, I think, what was the quote? I don't know if you guys have probably heard this, but of Justice Ginsburg had said something like, in every good marriage, it helps sometimes to be a little deaf. Right, right. You know? right. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, hold or fold. You know? So let's go back. Um, closer to the beginning of all of your careers. Let's go back to law school. Suzanne, starting with you, going through law school and getting into your career and, and the journey that was there that's led you to where you are today. Um, I will definitely say that what I thought was so in law school and I had it all figured out was is a total joke. Um, I don't think you have it figured out till at least your 10th year in practice. Um, maybe others are earlier, but um, I actually authored a little checklist a little while ago that said things I knew now that I wish I knew before law school, um, because there's a lot of things, you know, you got to do something that, you know, as a woman, this is sounds very, but as, a, as being empathetic, that you have to do an area of law that you love. If you don't, you're going to be bored. I'm sorry. 10 out of 10, that's the case. And I see in you know, all my co-panelists that their reasons for getting involved in law, a lot, you know, a lot of the reasons are very personal. And you can tell we all enjoy what we do. Um, if you're not, you know, enjoying it, it's gonna come across and stuff. So in law school, that was my point is that I actually wanted to be a maritime attorney. I'm not sure why, but that went I 360 degrees away and I've changed my my field you know, finally after my, in my last year. Great. Kendra, let's hear from your side. And also if there's been a significant hurdle that you faced along the way, anything you can share with us? Thank you. Um, goodness me. Well, in law school, I didn't know anything. Um, and I kind of fell into law school because I was in another career and it wasn't, it wasn't working out. So I took the LSAT, did really well, ended up in law school. Um, and then it was a matter of, okay, what is this law game? So because I had a science background, I was gonna go into patents. Um, and that was just, I was gonna take the patent bar. It was gonna be great um, until I learned what a patent was. And then at that point, I'm like, I don't know that I wanna spend my life doing this. And yeah. I ended up falling in with an insurance uh, bad faith firm that did a lot of courtroom work and a lot of trial work and got some amazing experience. And I realized, wow, I really like this court thing. I like fighting for the underdog. I like fighting for the little guy. Um, and then I decided that I had an entrepreneurial side. I wanted to go out on my own. And the business model that fit that was um, family law because I needed a business model that would work with the resources I had available. And I got into family law thinking that I would never like divorces, that I wouldn't like that dysfunction. But quite frankly, a couple of days of it, and I realized, hey, I do really well with dysfunction. In fact, I <laughs> excel in dysfunction. And these are really interesting cases. Like there are not two days that are ever the same. And I think it was my first restraining order case that I did that was a really big restraining order, had a lot of moving parts. Um, and I had a client who just... Like this was the difference between life and death for her. And we were victorious on a number number of levels. And that feeling and that reward made me realize, wow, 
I think I'm home. Like, I think this is exactly what I need to be doing. Um, and I think my biggest hurdle in all of it was just realizing that in law school, I didn't learn what I needed to know to practice law. Right. I learned what I needed to know to understand how law works, but I didn't know what I didn't know. And it was kind of an, an exercise in learning myself to realize um, you don't know everything and really humbling myself to understand that every day you learn in law. And that's what makes you a good advocate. That's what makes you an effective advocate. Um, and it's it's okay. It's okay to, you know, that's why we're practicing lawyers. But ultimately, I think that um, my, my journey has been a unique one, but it's been a fabulous one. Beautiful. Thank you, Kendra. Janice, over to you. So I um, graduated law school decades ago and got an LLM in litigation. So I knew that I wanted to argue for a living. And kind of like Kendra, I ended up defending doctors in insurance defense litigation and did that for many, many, many years. And as you said, April, in the introduction about uh, 15 years ago, I was sued by my ex for custody of my biological child. And we actually made law in New York. And I had uh, seven lawyers that I went through because as a lawyer, I think I'm, a, I guess I'm a difficult client. They told me that I was a difficult client, <laughs> but I really um, learned a lot. And I realized that this was going to be my passion. This had become my passion to help people uh, through probably the most difficult time of their lives. Mm -hmm. And I always say, because I was on that side of the table, I really gives me a much different perspective on how to be on this side of the table. Um, and I think that my clients hear that and feel that and see that. And it just, um, I, I mean, I, if you ask me in 1985, when I graduated law school, what I would be doing now in 2020, there is no way that I would have said um, I'd be doing uh, family law and helping, um, helping families. So you never know. Uh, the takeaway is you never know. I always say you just never know what's going to happen. And um, I'm grateful in a weird way that my ex sued me because it gave me a whole new career and a whole new passion and a real... I really feel like I'm helping people. I really do. And that's very healing even for me to yeah. do. Thank wow. you, Janice. And Karen. Um, the journey or what's been my biggest hurdle? I mean, since the beginning, my biggest hurdle has always been me and what's up here. And that going to law school was actually, I mean, that is the reason why I went to law school for the intellectual challenge. I, I had no idea what a lawyer really did. I didn't really know any lawyers. There weren't any in my family. I just wanted to see if I could do it. Um, even just getting into law school, I wanted to see if I could do it. And then when I, I remember sitting there the first day and I, I think I told two people I was in law school. I was so afraid of telling anybody because I didn't want to have to tell them that I failed out. <laughs> um, so after the first year when I was doing well, then I started telling people. But yeah, since, yeah, I don't know where, where to begin with that, but I just have such a tremendous respect for the law, just as an intellectual pursuit, as a helping profession. Um, I guess that's, that's what led me here today. Yeah. Thank you, Karen. And you're all such great partners for Hope Lawyer, and we're sure thrilled to work with all of you. So going back over to Suzanne. So not only is each one of you a, a great attorney that we're so proud to work together with, but you're all also business owners. So beginning with you, Suzanne, what made you decide to open up your own practice? Um, you know, there was, it was not any one thing. Um, my clients actually were begging me to go out on my own, um, to have unfettered discretion to, you know, give as much service as possible. For example, um, I typically don't bill by the hour and that's just because of transactional and because I, I know other people do it differently, but in the nature of the work that I'm doing, I don't want to have, you know, people think that, especially with this day and age of virtual that, you know, I'm picking up the phone just to, you know, like drum up time. I know in litigation, it's very different because obviously you're there. But in transactional, they don't really see what you're doing a lot of the time and everything. And I didn't want this like senior partner breathing down my back saying, where are your hours? You know, I did a great job, but I wasn't, you know, 
didn't or wasn't getting my hours, you know, for some reason. So I didn't want an economic function to be a, a sort of a challenge. I viewed in my field um, that is more of a let's call it a pragmatic business approach, you know, to the in the in the transactional world. Um, and that's, I guess, you base that's basically it. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Kendra, how about you? I think that I've always had um, the desire to look at law from kind of Janice's experience of sitting across the table from me and really understanding what that experience is. And when I would work for um, other firms, other bosses and had other masters and other priorities, I always found myself kind of complaining to my family members about, well, if I were doing things, this is how I'd wanna do them. And one day my mom looked at me and said, honey, um, he with the gold rules, like either put up or shut up, which if you know my family, that's not, <laughs> um, you know, she was being very loving and saying that, but it made me think about the fact like, wow, maybe that's right. Instead of complaining about the rules and complaining about the system, why don't I give it a try? Why don't I do things my way? Because I think if I did them my way, they'd be different. Um, and that really encouraged me to go out on my own and, you know, try to play by my own rules. Um, and I did that, I think about 15 years ago and we're still going strong. So definitely motivated by, um, probably different motivations in life, but very, very glad I took the risk. Kendra, thank you. Janice. So, um, when I worked for my, the last firm that I worked for at my, um, I guess my evaluation after billing thousands of hours. Uh, my boss said, um, you're just not a great employee. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I build all these hours. He said, yeah, but when we tell you to do something, you kind of have your own opinion and you do it your way. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, um, maybe, you know, it kind of was a, a, a bulb, a light bulb that said, maybe you should go do it your way. And um, I went out on my own. And then one night I was complaining to my mother, you know, it's how hard it is to be out on your own again over a couple of decades ago. And she said, oh, just go get a job. And I thought, go get a job. Is that what you want to do? Go get a job. And that it was that was the defining moment. I'm like, I am going to rock this off the charts. And from that moment on, I never looked back to go get a job. I knew that I had, you know, there was some fire in me all of a sudden that the combination of those two things. And here I am, uh, you know, as I said, I think 25 years later, I'm on my own. So that's a long time. That's great. Thank you, Janice. And Karen. Well, actually, in response to what, what Janet said, your, four, your four former employer said that you don't didn't do what they said. When I had an associate, one of the things I, I told her is like, I pay you to tell me why I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. Not, you know, like that is what you want another lawyer to find our problems, to challenge our yeah. positions, because that's what the other side's going to be doing. Um, but my answer, you know, I have to address first why I left the IRS and that was just like really a desire for a greater challenge. And then so many times I found myself as an IRS attorney sitting across the desk from a, a taxpayer, a private person and wanting to reach across the side of the desk or sit on that side and, and help them. And then I'd seen so many people that had been poorly served by their previous accountants and attorneys. So I knew that there was you know, such a need for someone in this area. Um, and something in my gut said I needed, I needed to go on my own for a while. I don't know why, but I knew if I hadn't, I would regret it. Um, yeah. So eight years later, here I am. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Great. Thank you, Karen. Suzanne, back over to you. What piece of advice would you give to another young woman that was looking to go into a field of law of some sorts? Um, obviously, you know, law involves most of the time like controversy and either there's an adversary or there's someone across the table. And I learned like, especially as a woman, that elegance and grace carry you a lot further than being you know just no, just a mad person i mean like in other words you can disagree without being disagreeable if that makes sense you know i um definitely 
my goal is usually when there's somebody on the other side of the table, um, you know, it's to get them to agree or I agree with them and have it turn out as, you know, being best of friends, which is always the case. There's never been another attorney that I have, you know, been at odds with. Um, I have this way of finessing relationships, thankfully, I think I got it from my mom, where, you know, it, it's just you can you can turn a you can diffuse a bomb, you can talk somebody off a cliff. Um, and I definitely think that's one of our superpowers um, <laughs> as women. Great. Suzanne, thank you. Sure. Kendra, how about you? Suzanne, I absolutely love that. Rule number one in my office is don't be a jerk. Now, <laughs> I don't necessarily succeed all the time in that, oh, but dear. I do think there is a lot of power in being, you can be adversaries, but you don't need to be rude and you don't need to be nasty or messy. So I absolutely love that. Um, I think what I would tell young woman going into law school or you going into the legal profession is follow your passion. Um, I So many people I've run into and so many students I run into, um, they come to me and they say law wasn't what I expected. And I also have the experience law is not what I expected, but many of the people that I speak to get into it for different reasons. A lot of them are economic, a lot of it are what they thought law would be, um, a lot of it are different reasons, and this is not going to be a sustaining career unless you're doing something that you enjoy or you're doing it for a reason that legitimately moves you forward. So I think following your passion, especially in this day and age, and especially with the year that we're coming out of, is especially important for those who are going into this field. Yeah. Thank you, Kendra. Janice. Yeah, I mean, I 100% agree with both Suzanne and Kendra. I mean, you do have to follow your passion. I mean, again, I've been a lawyer for 35 years in the first half or the first whatever, 15 years. I did my job. I enjoyed it. But my brother said to me, I never heard a story while you were doing your insurance defense litigation stuff. And now you're in this matrimonial stuff and you come home. I'm not going to say happy every day, but at least I, you come home and you tell me these stories and you feel, you know, some sense of fulfillment that you've helped people. So whatever is your driving moment, some people it is just making money. So then if that is, then you go find a big firm and you work a million hours a day and you that's your, your passion, right? But you have to identify what your passion is, figure out what your goal is, and then just grab it, just grab it. Great advice, Janice. Thank you. Karen. So over to you, and in addition, also being a business owner, if you touch on that as well in your answer. I've got the same response for both, whether for a woman thinking about starting law school or starting a business. If it's on your heart, if it's in your gut to do it, do it. Plenty of people will tell you, oh, there's too many lawyers. There's too many small businesses. The best advice I got was a lawyer that said, yes, there's too many lawyers, but there's always room for a good one. Yeah. Always. That's a good point, yeah. And, and the good thing about law is you can go to law school and you never have to practice law, but it gives you a new way to think and it, it empowers you and you can create any career out of law that you want. There's so many different areas and, and ways to practice or not practice that that education is going to serve you. That's true. Thank you, Karen. Suzanne, back over to you. So throughout your career, looking back at the landscape up to this point, has there ever been a time that you maybe were misjudged or underestimated and then you use that to your advantage? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, I, a lot of times, um, like, you know, I'll be in my office and business casual and I'll walk into a boardroom and it'll be all men and it's my office. They don't realize they're, you know, on behalf of the client and they thought that I was the secretary. So one of them asked me to get coffee. I said, sure. <laughs> so I went and got coffee for everyone. And then I went and proceeded and they kept looking at the head of the table. Like, I wonder if somebody's running late. And so I proceeded to give coffee and biscuits and a setup. And then I sat at the head of the table and started the meeting and I think they wanted to fall out of their chairs, you know, so I, you know, I definitely think sometimes the, you know, the, the sort of fawn image you can use to your advantage because you can definitely, you know, you're obviously more prepared and, you know, um, but 
and, and what are you going to do? I think you need to choose your battles. I'm not going to argue with somebody that I'm an attorney and I'm right and I'm not going to get caught. Sure, I'll get you coffee because I love people. So it makes me the happier person. And that's a, for me a win-win. Love it. Thank you, Suzanne. Kendra, how about you? Um, actually, yes, many times. Um, I would have situations where I would go into a courtroom or an, an area only for lawyers in the courtroom and I would have deputies running after me saying, hey, you look really young, you can't be in here. And I would look at them and say, hey, I was here all day yesterday, don't you recognize me? Oh, Ms. Thomas, we're so sorry. Um, I've had situations where um, opposing counsel will try to mansplain or explain law to me like I don't know because, and then they'll tell me, oh, we thought you were a new associate, you look very young. I've had people tell me, oh, wow, you actually speak well, um, meaning that it was a compliment, but I guess for my appearance, I didn't look like I had a full mastery of the English language. And these experiences, I've, I've had people mistake me for the court reporter. <laughs> um, I had a gentleman uh, opposing counsel, we were in the middle of high powered negotiations and he stopped to tell me, thinking that he could dissuade me from my point by uh, focusing on how beautiful he thought I was. Like all of these things like are weird, weird experiences. But what I've just come to realize is I now embrace when you look at me and you can't tell how long I've been practicing or you can't figure out what my knowledge base is or you question, well, do you know your stuff? Well, yeah, I'm a certified family law specialist, but I don't care if you know that because wherever we start, by the time we're done, you're gonna know that I know what we're doing here. But beforehand, I really worried about that. And now I just look at the fact that like, we're all human, we all have our biases. Um, and I think that at this point, it just makes for a good story at the no next cocktail party I go to. Yeah. But absolutely that stuff is out there, but I encourage people not necessarily to get upset about it and just use it as a tool. Um, I feel that I've actually gotten the upper hand in a few negotiations and a couple of trials because I was underestimated and the other side didn't prepare well. I had one judge uh, uh, after closing and after ruling remark, I didn't know what to expect with you, but you actually looked like an innocent barracuda out there. <laughs> okay, I'll take it. My client was happy. I was happy. But I, we're, we're human beings. And I think we all come into this with our preconceived notions. I hope I wouldn't judge anybody, but I know I probably do. But absolutely, I think it's part of the human experience. Great answer. Thank you, Kendra. Janice. Um, again, I'm going to agree with my colleagues, Suzanne and Kendra, 100 million percent that uh, People have asked me if I'm the secretary. People have asked me if I'm the court reporter. Used to be when I would call people on the phone, uh, my co my adversaries or colleagues, they would say, are you, a se are you the secretary for the lawyer? Yeah. Now they don't do that anymore, but they would always uh, do that. It was always incredible to me. Um, you know, I think that Kendra's right. People, everybody has biases and um, you just have to use it to, to your advantage. You know, I mean, one guy the other day told me, my ethical obligations to my client. And I'm like, you know, I've been practicing law longer than you're alive. And I've said that to people, and, you know? <laughs> so please don't, don't, don't give me a, uh, don't tell me what my ethical obligations are, sweetheart, you know? Um, so you just have to, you just have to keep going and do it as, as Suzanne said, I think it was you a long time ago with dignity and grace. And if you can continue to, cause otherwise, you know, the, I think that makes them feel smaller when you do it with dignity and grace. Uh, when you growl at them, they just think you're an, an angry woman. But if you do it with dignity and grace and a little sense of a bit of humor, then I think they it's feel like so small, right? Definitely. Uh, thank you, Janice. And Karen. I can't think of any specific situation where I've been underestimated because I think in most cases, we don't know, you know how much people estimate us. Um, I know that my greatest strength is not in getting in cat fights on the phone and, you know, coming back with quick retorts. And a lot of times just, you know, saying nothing has been my strongest point because in the end, it's, it's this, the pen that matters in most of our cases and what the law is. And it's not the person on the other side of the phone that you need to convince. It's the way you convey it in writing into the court. So I don't worry how I sound, you know, on the phone if I've got the quickest comeback because it doesn't matter. No. Yeah, yeah. I think there's more strength in listening 
and you know keeping quiet in times that you just were about to jump out of your skin then and you know taking the the low road i just um remembered now that we're having all these antidotes my one of my first training in my career i went to a training um facility for my first employer and i remember that the training facility was in such a small town that they only had like two events going on which was the event of the training which no one knew about and apparently this big hooters restaurant festival so i remember being asked left and right are you you're here for the hooters festival you need to go there and i'm like no i need to no no it's it's this way you know and and people are actually telling you look no you're wrong it's this way you're going this is where you need to be so I remember calling my mom, I was so mad. And she's like, why would you rather be, you know, like pitied or envied? And I think that it was, it, you know, it was, it was, you, you got to take a tongue in cheek. <laughs> this is a true story. <laughs> <laughs> Great stories all the way across the board. Susie, I'm staying with you. So with your practice area, Looking ahead, what changes do you hope to see? I hope, I mean, saying of all my co-panelists, Janice, Karen, and Kendra, I hope that people don't forget what the times we're in now and keep up that human element because it's so easy to lose and forget the blackout of 2020, if you will. Um, I really hope that the game has permanent changes. Um, I saw at least in the litigation front where um, there's going to be more and more Zoom hearings and trials even after the, you know, restrictions lift. So hopefully that will maintain at least the, you know, the efforts that you have to make to be more personable and human. Because a lot of that's lost, ironically, in person, and it's kept when you're here on a, like a Zoom call. Thank you, Suzanne. Sure. Kendra. How about you? I would absolutely echo Suzanne's comments. Um, I also hope that we maintain the technological aspect. I think that it is um, the technological aspect has really afforded access to the court system for people who might not otherwise, especially during such a difficult year, have that access. And I would love to see that continue. Um, I know, especially in the LA court system, it was difficult kind of getting us off the ground to have remote hearings and all of that. I would love to see that stay, um, but also uh, kind of part and parcel with that, even though we're more remote, I would still like to see that commonality, that human touch that we've just kind of, like we've all been through a year. So if we can keep the remote platform and still maintain some you know, commonality, some level of understanding, I think that it's really going to do my practice area a lot of good. Thank yeah. you, Kendra. Janice. Again, I echo Suzanne and Kendra. I'm sure I would echo Karen, but she always goes after me. <laughs> um, you know, we have been through a lot in 2020. I mean, New York is still not really up and running. There hasn't been a, a child support hearing in a year. So I feel very badly for those, for those people. We are still, um, you know, the personal injury people, those people that were injured, they're not seeing juries for probably another year. So we have a lot I don't know if that's what's going on in Florida and California, but we have a long way to go in New York to uh, get people up and running in a lot of different areas of the law. I mean, I find it uh, challenging to have a trial on, online sometimes because I want my client here next to me um, just because otherwise we're texting and listening and it's very complicated. But I think that the Zoom uh, is here to stay I think that a lot of the courts, a lot of the judges are really enjoying it. I'm mean, not enjoying it. They find it easier. Um, and I think that we'll all figure out how to get to the next level. Maybe my client will be here as opposed to in her home because everybody, you know, things are changing. But uh, technology will, will never go back, I don't think, to the way we practiced two years ago. And I agree with Suzanne's uh, theory or thinking that um, there's nothing wrong with a kinder, gentler nation. And I think that uh, it's kind of weird in family law to say, you know, you need to be kind to your ex, yeah. but you do actually, if you have children, especially you do need to be kind to your ex. And uh, being an, a, a horrible adversary is, you don't win that way yeah. at all. 
you think you win that way, but that's just anger and you should go see a therapist. We all are, are in this world together um, and there's nothing wrong with figuring out the best deal or trying to get a good deal for each other, but you don't have to do it uh, with anger. And I think I pray that uh, COVID has, has opened all of our eyes and hearts to what really, really matters. And, um, you know, and that's what we, whatever that means to each of us, but. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you, Janice. And Karen, last but not least. <laughs> I, I hope that how COVID has broken down our preconceived notions of what being a lawyer looks like or, you know, has transitioned to Zoom. You know, we know that we don't need big fancy offices. We know that we can go to law school and teach classes virtually. I hope that this opens up barriers that people of color and minorities and disabilities feel towards the law profession. Because for years, I have been the most diverse face in a lot of rooms, especially as a tax attorney. And this space should not be the picture of diversity, where like I'm just the only woman in, in a room full yeah. of men. So I hope that this makes, you know, the changes through this pandemic make it, you know, the practice more accessible to everybody. Yeah. Well said. Thank you, Karen. Suzanne, back over to you. And, you know, just reiterating, every one of you is such a, a tremendous leader and just a, what an incredible panel and just great, great people. So we would like to hear from each one of you, beginning with Suzanne, who is um, another woman that you admire and what the number one role that you try to live by each day is? Um. Well, having quoted her earlier, I think um, Justice Ginsburg is one of my biggest idols. Um, she often said the reason for entering law was to help people, you know, forget about cases and litigation. It was to help people. And maybe along the lines of Kendra's don't be a jerk sign. Um, I have a t-shirt that I often wear even to the office on casual Friday. It's gratitude. Like if you exercise gratitude, that's everything. It's kindness. It's caring. It's empathy. You're helping. You're, you know, and if you, you, you always just have to remember where you came from. Remember that life is so precious. And, you know, to give the COVID element, it, life is really precious when people are, everybody has a story, you know, of some sort of um, tragedy. And you, it's, it's definitely, I think, really made you focus on the work-life balance um, as, as my takeaway. It, your work-life balance is what you make it. The work's always going to be there, you know, and you kind of gives you a, di you know, a different, give, definitely a different perspective. Thank you, Suzanne. All right, Rupa. And Kendra, how about you? I have been very, very fortunate to have a lot of female mentors. Um, as I've kind of been on my journey. And it was sad, one of my um, one of my favorite mentors, I lost her during COVID. She was mm -hmm. instrumental in kind of teaching me um, not only the art of advocacy in terms of writing, but the art of um, advocacy in the courtroom. When you're winning, don't say anything. And not every argument needs a response. Um, not every quip needs a response. And sometimes there's more power in walking away. But I think that the longer that I do this, um, the women that I'm looking up to particularly are some of my clients. Now I represent men and women, but some of my clients have been kind of my biggest inspiration in terms of, I have clients that I worked with, especially in the intimate partner of violence setting where I got them restraining orders or custody orders or whatever orders they needed to get to the next phase of their life 15 years ago. And now when I run into them or I interact with them, they are completely different people. And they'll thank me and say, you know, you changed my life. And I look at them and I think, wow, having you as a client, what I learned from your case, what I learned from you also changed my life. So definitely that gratitude piece is a lot of it. Yeah. Outstanding, thank you, Kendra. Janice. Well, again, I, I wanna reiterate what Suzanne and Kendra have said, and also Karen, I'm sure, in retrospect. <laughs> But, also, <laughs> but Kendra, I'm so yeah. sorry for your loss. It's very hard. I'm, as, as Suzanne yeah. I think said, that we yeah. all know someone uh, 
uh, or I think, I don't know, it was Karen or Suzanne, we all know somebody who passed and uh, or has been devastated by COVID. So I, I do want to extend my sympathies to you. And I, I also have uh, uh, people who I trained with or under, I worked for a woman who is a big, big advocate of women's health care law. And she was instrumental in a lot of the DES litigation and Dow Conchia litigation. And she was the meanest, meanest boss, um, kindest, kindest to her, her clients. And I took a lot. I mean, she, she brought my level of practicing law really to the highest, uh, or she ex instilled me to be at the highest level possible. Um, but also to Kendra's point, I remember I had a client that came and I describe her as a broken carnation. And when she left, and now, because I'm still in touch with her, I describe her as my American beauty rose um, because she's just come so far in her, um, in her life. And I think it's really important for all of us to look around and to see who we can learn from. There's always in our day, uh, there's something that you can learn yes. um, from someone. Yes. You just have to be open to to hearing it. You're not all, I'm not God and I'm not the smartest person in the world. And, you know, sometimes I learn from the guy in the corner who's giving me a, a Diet Coke, or I hate to say I'm drinking Diet Coke. I hope my son isn't watching this, but um, the guy that's giving me a coffee um, because, you know, we all are, as I said, we're all in this together in our own little way. And we all have to look around and hope that we're somebody else's, we're teaching somebody else and they're learning from you and we're learning from somebody else. And I think if we can keep that in mind, I think that we'll go forward um, in a more positive way, which is required in, in 2021. Um, if I may real quick, I just wanna say something from the heart. Um, what I, we know it's interesting is that today, at least all these panelists, I can say with confidence, having even just met Janice and Kendra, and I, I know Karen, is that, Nobody is here for economic reasons. Nobody's here for the money. And it seems like, you know, that is so, I just, you know, we're changing the world one step at a time. And that feels so good. And to me, that is not unrealistic. Agreed. Sorry. Karen. <laughs> I'm learning so much from, from, from all of you. You know, I'm just having met you know, Janice and Kendra. I want to know more. Um, but one of my first mentors um, was Fran Sheehy, and she had a career much similar to mine, but about 20, 25, 20, 30 years before mine, when there was virtually no women in the area of tax law. So she really was a pioneer. And just a few weeks ago, um, a male mentor of mine reached out to me and said, look, there's this position available somewhere, and you really should go for it. And I, I swept him away. I was like, that's crazy. And, and he said, what would Fran say? And it brought it brought tears in my eyes because I was like, wow, that really hit me. You know, she, even though she's gone now, she's still a very powerful force in my life. Yeah. And as for words uh, that I live by, it's actually right behind me. You can see I keep the four agreements on my wall, but the first one is the most important to me, and it's to be impeccable with your word. Not just the words we say or the words we write, but the words we tell ourselves because they're powerful. They're yeah. magic, and they have. Yeah, they're magic and they have power and we have to watch what we say. So that's it. Incredible answers all the way across the board. What a group of women. You guys are really amazing. Suzanne, going back up to you as uh, we start closing out and I, I want you all to know what we'll, we'll all be connected on an email. We'll have coverage that'll be going out online. Mm -hmm. So you'll all be able to contact each other. So going back up to you, Suzanne, if we have you know people that want to work together with you, what's the easiest way to work together with you? How to reach out to you? Um, www.dewittplc.com. I think the website's the easiest because um, I'm you know using the office or my home office, so it's okay. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you. And Kendra. My website is also the easiest way to get a hold of us, and it's www.law-thomas.com. Great. Thank you, Kendra. Janice? I will again agree with my colleagues. At, uh, <laughs> the website. <laughs> at Jay Roven at, oh, it wrote, well, my 
uh, website is rovenlawgroup.com or jroven at rovenlawgroup.com, either way. Thank you, Janice. And yeah. last but not least, Karen. Yeah, you can just Google my name or lapikaslaw.com. Great. Thank you, Karen. And looking ahead to the remainder of 2021, Suzanne, um, we've, we've covered this a little bit, but what, what's the biggest takeaway you hope someone has from this year, you know, moving through this year? Um, I can't say it enough. Um, be human. You know, you don't need to be the smartest person in the room. Just be human and the rest will follow. Great. Thank you, Suzanne. Kendra. Yeah, I, I love that. And I love the you know, incorporating the element of don't be a jerk. Um, you'll no, I mean, just remembering what we've all been through in the last year, being nice will get you a lot farther and garner you, I think, a lot of understanding, especially if you've been hit by COVID or especially if you're looking for some type of dispensation. So, um, you know, be human, don't be a jerk. And I think 2021, it's got to be better than 2020, right? I think that's our line be human, don't be a jerk. That'll be our panel. <laughs> I'll make the shirts. <laughs> <laughs> and Janice, over to you. Again, I, I will, uh, you know, my colleagues, Kendra and Suzanne, I, I agree 100%. And kind of adding on that is make today your best day ever, mm -hmm. you know? And if you make today or each day your best day ever, you're going to have the best year ever. And we've all had a rough year, some rougher than others, some not so rough, right? Some businesses have thrived in this horribleness uh, mm -hmm. with people dying around them. But every day you need to wake up and say, this is going to be a great, this is going to be my best day ever, better than yesterday. And it will be. And then you'll look back on 2021 and you'll say, wow, that was a great year because it's all, you have to be positive. Again, don't be a jerk, be grateful, be humble, but know that when you wake up, make it your best day ever. Yeah. Terrific. Thank you. Janice and Karen. Awesome. And mine's always, I tell this to my clients all the time that there's a season for everything. Maybe there's a season for owing the IRS and there's a season for paying them back. Maybe this is for planting or sowing. And you have to remember if it's a bad time, it's not going to last. And if it's a good time, it's probably not going to last either. Uh, right. <laughs> Well, um, again, what a great group. Thank you all so much for your time today. And I'll be connecting everyone on email and we'll have coverage going out online as well. And um, what, what great partners and what, what great people. Thank you all so much, Suzanne, Janice, Kendra, Karen. Thank you, April. Thank you for Thank you being all. a great hostess. And then Thanks. introduce us to our new friends. I'm so excited. <laughs> Absolutely. So, wishing you all a, a great remainder of your Friday and, and weekend ahead and um, into next week and for you all to stay safe and healthy and, and your teams as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.